Good evening, listeners. This is Papa Redwood. And tonight we're bringing you a story a little longer than the last. A short story written by M.R. James. The story is entitled Lost Hearts. It was, as far as I could ascertain, in September of the year 1811, that a post chase drew up before the door of Aswarby Hall in the heart of Lincolnshire. The little boy who was the only passenger in the chase, and who jumped out as soon as it had stopped, looked about him with the keenest curiosity during the short interval that elapsed between the ringing of the bell and the opening of the hall door. He saw a tall, square, red brick house built in the reign of Anne. A stone pillared porch had been added in the pure classical style of 1790. The windows of the house were many, tall and narrow, with small panes and thick white woodwork. A pendiment, pierced with a round window, crowned the front. There were wings to right and left, connected by curious glazed galleries, supported by colonnades with the central block. These wings plainly contained the stables and offices of the house. Each was surmounted by an ornamental cupola with a gilded vein. An evening light shone on the building, making the window panes glow like so many fires. Away from the hall in front stretched a flat park, studded with oaks and fringed with firs, which stood out against the sky. The clock in the church tower, buried in trees on the edge of the park, only its golden weathercock catching the light, was striking six, and the sound came gently beating down the wind. It was altogether a pleasant impression, though tinged with the sort of melancholy appropriate to an evening in early autumn that was conveyed to the mind of the boy who was standing in the porch, waiting for the door to open to him. The post-chase had brought him from Warwickshire, where, some six months before, he had been left an orphan. Now, owing to the generous offer of his elderly cousin, Mr. Abney, he had come to live at Aswarby. The offer was unexpected, because all who knew anything of Mr. Abney looked upon him as a somewhat austere recluse, and to steady-going household the advent of a small boy would import a new and, it seemed, incongruous element. The truth is that very little was known of Mr. Abney's pursuits or temper. The professor of Greek at Cambridge had been heard to say that no one was more of the religious beliefs of the later pagans than did the owner of Aswerby. Certainly his library contained all the then available books bearing on the mysteries. The Orphic poems, the worship of Mithras, and the Neoplatonists in the marble-paved hall stood a fine group of Mithras slaying a bull, which had been imported from the Levant at great expense by the owner. He had contributed a description of it to the gentleman's magazine, and he had written a remarkable series of articles in the Critical Museum on the superstitions of the Romans of the Lower Empire. He was looked upon, in fine, as a man wrapped up in his books, and it was a matter of great surprise among his neighbors that he should never have heard of his orphan cousin, Stephen Elliot, much more that he should have volunteered to make him an inmate of Aswarby Hall. Whatever may have been expected by his neighbors, it is certain that Mr. Abney, the tall, the thin, the austere, seemed inclined to give his young cousin a kindly reception. The moment the front door was opened, he darted out of his study, rubbing his hands with delight. "'How are you, my boy? How are you? How old are you?' said he. "'That is, you are not too much tired, I hope.' by your journey to eat your supper. No, thank you, sir, said Master Elliot. I am pretty well. That's good, lad, said Mr. Abney. And how old are you, my boy? It seemed a little odd that he should have asked the question twice in the first two minutes of their acquaintance. I'm twelve years old next birthday, sir, said Stephen. And when is your birthday, my dear boy? Eleventh of September, eh? That's well, That's very well. Nearly a year hence, isn't it? I like... <laughs> I like to get these things down in my book. Sure it's twelve? Certain. Y yes, quite certain, sir. Well, well. Take him to Mrs. Bunch's room, Parks, and let him have his tea, supper, whatever it is. Yes, sir, answered the staid Mr. Parks, and conducted Stephen to the lower regions. Mrs. Bunch was the most comfortable and human person whom Stephen had met at Aswarby. She had made him completely at home. 
They were great friends in a quarter of an hour, and great friends they remained. Mrs. Bunch had been born in the neighborhood some fifty-five years before the date of Stephen's arrival, and her residence at the hall was of twenty years' standing. Consequently, if anyone knew the ins and outs of the house and the district, Mrs. Bunch knew them, and she was by no means disinclined to communicate her information. Certainly there were plenty of things about the hall and the hall gardens which Stephen, who was of an adventurous and inquiring turn, was anxious to have explained to him. Who built the temple at the end of the laurel walk? Who was the old man whose picture hung on the staircase, sitting at a table with a skull under his hand? These and many similar points were cleared up by the resources of Mrs. Bunch's powerful intellect. There were others, however, of which the explanations furnished were less satisfactory. One November evening, Stephen was sitting by the fire in the housekeeper's room, reflecting on his surroundings. Is Mr. Abney a good man, and will he go to heaven? He suddenly asked, with a peculiar confidence which children possess in the ability of their elders to settle these questions, the decision of which is believed to be reserved for other tribunals. Good, bless the child, said Mrs. Bunch. Master's as kind a soul as ever I see. Didn't I never tell you of the little boy as he took him out of the street, as you may say, this seven years back, and the little girl two years after I first come here? No, do tell me all about them, Mrs. Bunch. Now this minute. Well, said Mrs. Bunch, the little girl I don't seem to recollect so much about. I know Master brought her back with him from his walk one day and give orders to Mrs. Ellis as was housekeeper then, as she should be took every care with, and the poor child hadn't no one belonging to her. She told me so her own self. And here she lived, with us, a matter of three weeks as it might be, and then, whether she were something of a gypsy in her blood or what not, but one morning she, out of her bed before any of us had opened an eye, and neither track nor trace of her have I set eyes on sense. Master was wonderful put about, and had all the pawns drained. But it's my belief that she was had away by them gypsies, for there was singing round the house for as much as an hour the night she went, and Parks, he declare as he heard them a-calling in the woods all that afternoon. Dear, dear, a hard child she was, so silent in her ways and all, but I was wonderful taken up with her. So domesticated she was, surprising. And what about the little boy? said Stephen. Ah, that poor boy, sighed Mrs. Bunch. He were a foreigner, Giovanni he called himself, and he come a tweak in his early gurdy round and about the drive one winter day, and Master Adam in that minute and asked all about where he came from, and how old he was, and how he made his way, and where was his relatives, and all as kind as heart could wish, but it went the same way with him. They're a unruly lot, them foreign nations, I do suppose, and he was off one fine morning just the same as the girl. Why, he went, and what he done was our question for as much as a year after. For he never took his hurdy gurdy, and there lays on the shelf. The remainder of the evening was spent by Stephen in miscellaneous cross examination of Mrs. Bunch and in efforts to extract a tune from the hurdy gurdy. That night he had a curious dream. At the end of the passage at the top of this house, in which his bedroom was situated, there was an old disused bathroom. It was kept locked, but the upper half of the door was glazed, and since the muslin curtains which used to hang there had long been gone. You could look in and see the lead-lined bath affixed to the wall on the right hand, with its head towards the window. On the night of which I am speaking, Stephen Elliot found himself, as he thought, looking through the glazed door. The moon was shining through the window, and he was gazing at a figure which lay in the bath. His description of what he saw reminds me of what I once beheld myself in the famous vaults of St. Micken's Church in Dublin, which possesses the horrid property of preserving corpses from decay for centuries. A figure, inexpressibly thin and pathetic, of a dusty leaden color, 
enveloped in a shroud-like garment. The thin lips crooked into a faint and dreadful smile, the hands pressed tightly over the region of the heart. As he looked up upon it, a distant, almost an audible moan seemed to issue from its lips, and the arms began to stir. The terror of the sight forced Stephen backwards, and he awoke to the fact that he was indeed standing on the cold, boarded floor of the passage in the full light of the moon. With a courage which I do not think can be common among boys of his age, he went to the door of the bathroom to ascertain if the figure of his dreams were really there. It was not, and he went back to bed. Mrs. Bunch was much impressed the next morning by his story, and went so far as to replace the muslin curtain over the glazed door of the bathroom. Mr. Abney, moreover, to whom he confided his experiences at breakfast, was greatly interested and made notes of the matter in what he called his book. The spring equinox was approaching, as Mr. Abney frequently reminded his cousin, adding that this had always been considered by the ancients to be a critical time for the young, that Stephen would do well to take care of himself and to shut his bedroom window at night, and that, since Arenas's had some valuable remarks on the subject, Two incidents that occurred about this time made an impression upon Stephen's mind. The first was after an unusually uneasy and oppressed night that he had passed, though he could not recall any particular dream that he had had. The following events of Mrs. Bunch was occupying herself in mending his nightgown. "'Gracious me, Master Stephen,' she broke forth rather irritably. "'How do you manage to tear your nitrous all to flinders this way? Look here, sir. What trouble you do!' Give to poor servants that have to dine and mend after you. There was indeed a most destructive and apparently wanton series of slits or scorings in the garment, which would undoubtedly require a skillful needle to make good. They were confined to the left side of the chest, long, parallel slits about six inches in length, some of them not quite piercing the texture of the linen. Stephen could only express his entire ignorance of their origin. He was sure they were not there the night before. But, he said, Mrs. Bunch, they are just the same as the scratches on the outside of my bedroom door, and I'm sure I never had anything to do with making them. Mrs. Bunch gazed at him open-mouthed, and snatched up a candle, departed hastily from the room, and was heard making her way upstairs. In a few minutes she came down. Well, she said, Master Stephen... It's a funny thing to me how them marks and scratches can a come there. Too high up for any cat or dog to have made them, much less a rat, for all the world like a Chinaman's fingernails, as my uncle in the tea trade used to tell us of when we was girls together. I wouldn't say nothing to Master, not if I was you, Master Stephen, my dear. I'd just turn the key of the door when you go to your bed. I always do, Mrs. Bunch. As soon as I've said my prayers. Ah, that's a good child. Always say your prayers, and then no one can hurt you. Herewith, Mrs. Bunch addressed herself to mending the injured nightgown with intervals of meditation until bedtime. This was on a Friday night in March, 1812. On the following evening, the usual duet of Stephen and Mrs. Bunch was augmented by the sudden arrival of Mr. Parks. The butler who as a rule kept to himself, or rather to himself, in his own pantry. He did not see that Stephen was there. He was, moreover, flustered and less slow of speech than was his wont. Master may get up his own wine if he likes, of an evening, was his first remark. Either I do it in the daytime or not at all, Mrs. Bunch. I don't know what it may be. Very well it's the rats, or the wind got into the cellars. But I'm not so young as I was, and I can't go through with it as I have done. Well, Mr. Parks, you know it is a surprising place for the rats in the hall. I'm not denying that, Mrs. Bunch. And, to be sure, many a time I've heard the tale from the men in the shipyards about the rat that could speak. I never laid no confidence in that before, but tonight, if I demeaned myself to lay my ear to the door of the further bin... I could pretty much have heard what they were saying. Oh, there, Mr. Parks, I've no patience with your fancies. Rats talking in the wine cellar, indeed. Well, Mrs. Bunch, I've no wish to argue with you. All I say is, if you choose to go to the far bin, 
and lay your ear upon the door. You may prove my words this minute. What nonsense do you talk, Mr. Parks? Not fit for children to listen to. Why, you'll be frightening Master Stephen there out of his wits. What? Master Stephen, said Parks, awakening to the consciousness of the boy's presence. Master Stephen knows well enough when I'm playing a joke with you, Mrs. Bunch. In fact, Master Stephen knew much too well to suppose that Mr. Parks had in the first instance intended a joke. He was interested, not altogether pleasantly, in the situation. But all his questions were unsuccessful in inducing the butler to give up any more detailed account of his experiences in the wine cellar. We have now arrived at March 24th, 1812. It was a day of curious experiences for Stephen, a windy, noisy day, which filled the house and the gardens with a restless impression. As Stephen stood by the fence of the grounds and looked out into the park, he felt as if an endless procession of unseen people were sweeping past him on the wind, borne on restlessly and aimlessly, vainly striving to stop themselves to catch at something that might arrest their flight and bring them once again into contact with the living world of which they had formed a part. After luncheon that day, Mr. Abney said, Stephen, my boy, do you think you can manage to come to me tonight as late as eleven o'clock in my study? I shall be busy until that time, and I wish to show you something connected with your future life, which it is most important that you should know. You are not to mention this matter to Mrs. Bunch nor to anyone else in the house. And you had better go to your room at the usual time. Here was a new excitement added to life. Stephen eagerly grasped at the opportunity of sitting up until eleven o'clock. He looked into the library door on his way upstairs that evening and saw a brazier, which he had often noticed in the corner of the room, moved out before the fire. An old silver gilt cup stood on the table, filled with red wine, and some written sheets of paper lay near it. Mr. Abney was sprinkling some incense on the brazier from a round silver box as Stephen passed, but did not seem to notice his step. The wind had fallen, and there was a still night and a full moon. At about ten o'clock, Stephen was standing at the open window of his bedroom, looking out over the country. Still as the night was, the mysterious population of the distant moonlit woods was not yet lulled to rest. From time to time, strange cries, as of lost and despairing wanderers, sounded from across the mere. They might be the notes of owls or water birds, yet they did not quite resemble either sound. Were not they coming nearer? Now they sounded from the nearer side of the water, and in a few moments they seemed to be floating about among the shrubberies. Then they ceased. But just as Stephen was thinking of shutting the window and resuming his reading of Robinson Crusoe, he caught sight of two figures standing on the graveled terrace that ran along the garden side of the hall, the figures of a boy and girl, as it seemed. They stood side by side, looking up at the windows. Something in the form of the girl recalled irresistibly his dream of the figure in the bath. The boy inspired him with more acute fear. Whilst the girl stood still, half smiling, with her hands clasped over her heart, the boy, a thin shape, with black hair and ragged clothing, raised his arms in the air with an appearance of menace and of unappeasable hunger and longing. The moon shone upon his almost transparent hands, and Stephen saw that the nails were fearfully long and that the light shone through them. As he stood with his arms thus raised, he disclosed a terrifying spectacle. On the left side of his chest, there opened a black and gaping rent, and there fell upon Stephen's brain, rather than upon his ear, the impression of one of those hungry and desolate cries that he had heard resounding over the woods of Azorby all that evening. In another moment, this dreadful pair had moved swiftly and noiselessly over the dry gravel, and he saw them no more. Inexpressibly frightened as he was, he determined to take his candle and go down to Mr. Abney's study, for the hour appointed for their meeting was near at hand. The study or library opened out of the front hall on one side, and Stephen, urged on by his terrors, did not take long in getting there. To effect an entrance was not so easy. It was not locked. He felt sure, for the key was on the outside of the door as usual. 
He repeated knocks, produced no answer. Mr. Abney was enraged. He was speaking. What? Why did he try to cry out? And why was the cry choked in his throat? He Had he, too, seen the mysterious children? But now everything was quiet, and the door yielded to Stephen's terrified and frantic pushing. On the table in Mr. Abney's study, certain papers were found which explained the situation to Stephen Elliot when he was of an age to understand them. The most important sentences were as follows. It was a belief, very strongly and generally held by the ancients, of whose wisdom in these matters I have had such experiences as induces me to place confidence in their assertions, that by enacting certain processes, which to us moderns have something of a barbaric complexion, a very remarkable enlightenment of the spiritual faculties in man may be attained, that, for example, by absorbing the personalities of a certain number of his fellow creatures, an individual may gain a complete ascendancy over those orders of spiritual beings which control the elemental forces of our universe. It is recorded of Simon Magus that he was able to fly in the air, to become invisible, or to assume any form he pleased, by the agency of the soul of a boy whom, to use the libelous phrase employed by the author of the Clementine Recognitions, he had murdered. I find it set down, moreover, with considerable detail in the writings of Hermes, Trismegistus, that similar happy results may be produced by the absorption of the hearts of not less than three human beings below the age of twenty-one years. To the testing of the truth of this receipt, I have devoted the greater part of the last twenty years, selecting as the corpora vilia of my experiment such persons as could conveniently be removed without occasioning a sensible gap in society. The first step I effected by the removal of one Phoebe Stanley, a girl of gypsy extraction, on March 24th, 1792. The second, by the removal of a wandering Italian lad named Giovanni Paoli, on the night of March 23rd, 1805. The final victim, to employ a word but repugnant in the highest degree to my feelings, must be my cousin, Stephen Elliot. His day must be this March 24th, 1812. The best means of effecting the required absorption is to remove the heart from the living subject to reduce it to ashes, and to mingle them with about a pint of some red wine, preferably port. The remains of the first two subjects, at least, it will be well to conceal. A disused bathroom or wine cellar will be found convenient for such a purpose. Some annoyance may be experienced from the psychic portion of the subjects, which popular language dignifies with the name of ghosts. But the man of philosophic temperament, to whom alone the experiment is appropriate, will be little prone to attach importance to the feeble efforts of these beings to wreak their vengeance on him. I contemplate, with the liveliest satisfaction, the enlarged and emancipated existence which the experiment, if successful, will confer on me, not only placing me beyond the reach of human justice, so called, but eliminating to a great extent the prospect of death itself. Mr. Abney was found dead in his chair, his head thrown back, his face stamped with an expression of rage, fright, and mortal pain. In his left side was a terrible, lacerated wound, exposing the heart. There was no blood on his hands, and a long knife that lay on the table was perfectly clean. A savage wild cat might have inflicted the injuries. The window of the study was open, and it was the opinion of the coroner that Mr. Abney had met his death by the agency of some wild creature. But Stephen Elliott's studies of the papers I have quoted led him to a very different conclusion. Well, listeners, I don't know too much about rituals, but I do think that Mr. Abney found his justice of another nature. Perhaps not mortal, but nevertheless justice. Thank you for listening. I hope you all have enjoyed tonight's reading of Lost Hearts by M.R. James. Sleep tight. 
Have yourselves a wonderful week. And enjoy some R&R. &R.